What is going on guys? Welcome back to another architecture review video. Uh, this time we're going to be talking about a asynchronous online gaming application on AWS. Uh, now this isn't in regards to any particular gaming application. This is just kind of a general pattern or a general infrastructure pattern that you can apply to your online game. And it's cool because it's got all the layers you need to start with a very small population and very easily grow that out. Uh, so that's the benefit of using AWS. You really get that built-in flexibility. And that's really what this uh, architecture is all about, setting you up for success. So this uh, video is going to be a little bit different. I'm not going to kind of go through everything that's over on the side here and walk you through one by one and read them out to you. Uh, I already kind of read these in advance. I'm already pretty familiar with what's going on here. So I'm just going to kind of give you the TLDR of what's happening in this diagram. And we're going to walk through it step by step. So let's just jump right into it. Um, just kind of bird's eye view, taking a look here. So they obviously, like this isn't a super sophisticated architecture. Um, there's not like too many services involved here. So it's not like completely overwhelming, but it's also a pretty good starting point where you see a lot of different breadth of different services that you can use. Um, so let's start kind of just following the numbers because I think it makes the most sense. All right, so starting with RHEL 53, this is no surprise here. This is for uh, DNS resolution. And they talk about using the uh, routing rules as part of RHEL 53 to ensure that their service endpoints are up at all times. This has to do with the health checks that you can apply to your endpoints and the um, either EC2 machines or other hardware machines that are behind your DNS to make sure that you know if one goes down, you can take that out of the DNS. So you have a bunch of different controls that you can use there in order to uh, ensure that your DNS or your domain is always up and running. So that's what's going on with number one. We see here that we have our player starting out to there, um, hitting the internet gateway. That's going to Route 53. Then from there, it's going to number two. And actually, let me just get a different color here to follow the trace. So we're going to an elastic load balancer. They don't tell you here if this is an ALB or an ELB. Uh, just to kind of briefly mention the difference, the ALB is more for HTTP, HTTPS, and header-based routing, whereas an ELB is more for um, TCP um, kind of network traffic, so not your, your traditional uh, HTTPS. Um, we notice here that they have, I just want to pause for a second, notice they have two different subnets and again, a different color. Uh, so two different subnets here. So uh, one public, so public one in this AZ and a second subnet also public in a different AZ. And AZs do what, as you would expect, their availability zones, they ensure that if anything ever happens to your application uh, and all your infrastructure is in one physical location, say a fire, say an earthquake, say some other catastrophic thing, then your application could still running. This is a pattern that you will see in AWS time and time again, the advantage of leveraging availability zones to ensure high availability. Uh, so just walking this forward really quick. So elastic load balancers are wired up to these public subnets. And there are some web servers here, as you can see. And um, they, they don't mention it here, but if they're using EC2 machines, there's what's called a target group. And within the target group, that's where you kind of assign your machines. It's within that grouping. Um, and there could be multiple target groups that are associated with a load balancer. So you can kind of have round robin in terms of distribution of where your traffic goes. Uh, so it's good to see that they are using that. So um, public subnets here, one and two, and this is hitting their web servers. So this makes me believe that this is just kind of their entry point to their applications. In other words, these web servers here at the front aren't really responsible for any business logic. They're just kind of the, the um, front of the application so that if there's a DDoS or something, it only happens at the web server layer and not the back end like business logic domain service layer. So that's what they got going on here, which is a good pattern to follow. Uh, don't worry about the NAT gateway. That's for something else. Uh, that's just to get outbound internet access in our other subnet. But let's just uh, walk through a little bit further. So uh, we have this direction here. So our web servers are going to a different load balancer, a uh, different load balancer. And this load balancer is wired up to different app servers. So you can see app server number one and app server number two. And everything in this kind of red box that I'm drawing here is in their private subnet. So this is going to be shielded from basically everything. Um, the only thing that's going to be really able to talk to anything that's in the private subnet is stuff that is in the public subnet. So no, none of this, none of stuff coming from the outside world. It's not going to happen. Uh, so that's what's going on there. So they're using the load balancer that's connected to the app servers. So the path goes like this. 
um, and it goes like that. Okay, so uh, moving on to the database portion now. So we can see here that they are taking advantage of a caching component, and that caching component is from AWS Elastic Cache, and they are using Redis. Uh, Elastic Cache is just a caching service. It allows you to set up a cluster of machines that all exist, um, and their goal or their intent is to just cache information, so keep their data in memory. This is more of an optimization. You don't always need a cache, but if you have uh, calls that are being made against the same keys very regularly, it's a really big help in terms of reducing the load on your uh, more permanent data store, which is more to the right. But let's get to that in a second. I do want to pause here and call out a couple things um, because this is where the architecture starts to get a little bit interesting. Um, so they bring they note here that they have this notion of Redis primary. And this one down here is a Redis secondary. And if you follow the arrows, like if you look at app servers, like how are, who are app servers talking to now, notice that app server down here isn't talking to this one, as we saw in you know, everything that was going on over here. Um, what is happening instead is that it is talking, well, they are both talking to the primary. They are both talking to the primary. And so effectively, that means that this secondary instance is just in standby mode. It's not fielding any traffic. It's just kind of sitting there just in case something goes wrong uh, with the primary cache. Maybe it gets nuked or um, I don't know, something, there's a poison pill and it corrupts the cache. Then the stand, standby or the secondary will take its place and start serving all the traffic. So pretty cool there. Um, and this is very easy to do with uh, Elastic Cache. It's just a configuration on your cluster. Uh, do keep in mind there's obviously extra costs for doing this, so it's not a free ticket to have higher availability. And that's what it's all about, higher availability. And um, yeah, that's just how uh, you can do it. All right, now moving on to the more permanent data store, um, they are using Amazon Aurora for that. And within a single AZ, they have a standby, which is a read replica. Uh, so essentially, anytime this thing goes down, the main goes down, it's going to automatically fail over to the read replica. Uh, so that is good for just your primary failure. But if the whole AZ goes down, like the entire this thing goes down, then you have this backup that exists over here to take over. And this is really where like the value comes in, like this AZ failure, which, you know, it doesn't happen very often, but when it does happen, you really want to minimize your uh, impact. And it's kind of unpredictable. You never know, you know, where there's going to be a flood or power outage or failure or whatever, you know, any kind of catastrophic event. But anyways, um, they have this automatic failover within one AZ and within amongst many AZs. So that gives added protection. And um, they don't actually, yeah, I just erased that. And they don't note here um, exactly how the, the relationship is built between the cache and the uh, database itself. But what I would suspect is happening is that they use a classic uh, read from the cache. If it's not there, go and get the value from the permanent data store. And then if you find that value, put it into the cache. This is a very classic pattern. And anytime anyone wants to perform a write, they will write directly. Let me actually just get a different color. They will write directly to the cache and then they will subsequently write to your uh, primary data store. Uh, so that is one option here. They don't really get into that uh, on the description section, but that is kind of what's happening. Um, so that's about it for like the primary flow. They do mention down here that there's an option to use DynamoDB, um, which is reasonable here, like as an alternative to Aurora. And like, why not? Um, Amazon DynamoDB is even more scalable, but maybe just starting out, it may not be for you, it could be overkill. Uh, it's always a good idea to start simple and then leave room to evolve. But uh, they do call that out as a potential option to increase uh, scalability. Um, the next part here is SNS. So this is cool if you want to push notifications back out into your players. Um, so for instance, if you want to say something like your friend Jamie got a badge in this game or you know they, they reached a level, to kind of motivate people to log on to your app or motivate people to log on to your game. That's a very easy way to do it. And you can do it through SNS, which has native integration with like the um, iPhone and Android and even the Amazon API, a whole bunch of different APIs. So you can directly integrate with these devices and send these push notifications. Um, now, lastly, but not least, they are using CloudFront combined with S3, um, S3 for storage of their assets themselves. So this can include things like uh, textures, things like sound files, things like uh, images, any other assets that you may need. And that's kind of the more uh, durable store. 
and CloudFront is edge caching. So it kind of distributes your, your resources to nodes all across the world so that you have better performance uh, for users that are all across the world. So I think this architecture is a very good template for someone starting out that wants to start an online game uh, that could be very successful. So you're kind of leaving the door open to evolve to something a little bit bigger with all these kind of heavy technologies that have elastic scalability. So that is, uh, if that's you, then this is a good uh, architecture to follow. This is also a very useful architecture for like, for even just like web apps or any, any backend microservice architecture. This is a, a classic pattern that people follow. Uh, so it may be worthwhile to you there. So if you enjoyed this video, check out this one on the right here for a playlist on my AWS architecture review series. Thanks so much guys. And I'll see you next time.